And there it goes. All right. Welcome, everybody, to our special Earth Day poetry reading and panel. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping things. There are captions available, auto-generated captions from Zoom. If you're in the Zoom webinar, you should see a little CC live transcript button at the bottom. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, there should also be a captions option there. So feel free to make use of that. My name is Susan Deutsch. I'm the program manager at the Muse Writer Center. We are a nonprofit writing center in Norfolk, Virginia, and we have lots of classes and events and outreach programs um, and partner events such as this one. And actually our summer class schedule came out yesterday, which is very exciting because we are finally back to doing some in-person classes. We still have our virtual classes and a lot actually are hybrid. We have a new hybrid system, so you could attend either virtually or in person at the Muse. Well, we're very excited about that. So uh, if you're interested, check out the-muse.org and also to see more upcoming events, including one a week from today, also with Louisa. Um, another housekeeping note, any and all work read today is property of the author unless otherwise noted and this event is in no way a publication of unpublished works and here to tell us more about today's poets is Luisa Gloria uh, the Virginia Poet Laureate and a muse teacher and board member and professor at ODU and all around wonderful poet and person here's Luisa thank you Susan hello everyone I really am so happy to be here here with all of you uh, thank you for joining us this evening or morning, as the case may be. Thank you for being awake so early. And of course, I want to thank everyone who's made this program happen, uh, not least of all the Writer Center, um, Muse Writer Center in Norfolk for its continuing generosity, sharing its resources. And thank you, Susan and Michael. I also have to say thank you to the Academy of American Poets and the Mellon Foundation, whose support has made my work and projects as Virginia's 20th Poet Laureate really and truly possible. It's really been a joy. I'm coming to the end of my term, but I feel like there's still so much that needs to be done. Anyway, some of the things I've been busy with in the past year and a half, I'm gonna drop some little promos here, uh, included building the Virginia Poets database, which I encourage you to check out if you identify as a Virginia poet. So we also have a poetry spotlight section where for Napomo this month, I have gathered poetry prompts and they will be archived beyond April. So I'm, I'm dropping the link to that in the chat. And on the blog section of my website, I'm going to cut and paste another one, uh, is um, my other project, uh, a poetry postcard project, which has been really, really fun uh, to get the poems and the artwork. And so um, that being said, again, I can't tell you how excited I am for this program featuring these four amazing writers. So as you know, coincidentally, it's Earth Day, which I didn't realize when I was planning this for this date. But uh, as you know, Earth Day started in 1970 as an outgrowth of a UNESCO led um, uh, teach in about the importance of protecting the environment. And I, am, I have read that over 20 million people took part in an Earth Day protest at that time, and in the years after, Earth Day events were uh, organized in more than 140 countries internationally. So wherever we might be on top of the last three strange pandemic years and the incredible pressures of trying to shift our practices while trying to take care of ourselves and others. So we're all seeing and feeling the increasingly stark effects on a global scale of all of these accelerated environmental changes. And since all aspects of our lives are interconnected, these changes show up as well in the status and quality of our health and well being. So, here, by which I mean where I am here in Hampton Roads, we know that the summer months are almost here, and we know that people are going to be flocking to those beaches. But we are also acutely aware that we live in a coastal area prone to flooding, and it seems to be getting worse each year. So when I approached our guests with the invitation for this program, I just really said, I was really curious to hear more about where they are and what part of the world they currently find themselves in and what, if any, has changed for them and in what way. And I certainly recognize the ache. Uh, this is from one of Diana Woodcock's uh, poems uh, where she says, and here's the quote, doesn't everyone wish for a happy ending? 
endangered ecosystem restored to its splendor. So we all harbor a hope, a wish. But besides reading from their work, our guests will also talk a little bit about how their relationship to their natural environment and community figures in their art making and any advocacies. So towards the end of the program, we'll take questions from our viewers. Please drop them into the chat. We'll also use that time to continue our conversation. So our first reader, drum roll, is Tyree Day. Welcome, Tyree. Uh, Tyree hails from Youngsville, North Carolina. And he has a lovely list of beautiful awards, and uh, some of them are listed in the bio and the event page. But for me, when I read Tyree's poems, I feel so um, immediately grounded and simultaneously connected to others when he writes about the foundations laid uh, by, by family and place and by kinship circles. So I'm so excited to hear Tyree read and share with us. Thank you so much for having me. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, so I wrote a little bit about, uh, it's a little tiny bit about how I think about nature and my work. So uh, my name is Tyree Day. I'm coming you, coming from you from Raleigh, North Carolina, which is about 20, about 45 minutes from my hometown of Youngsville, North Carolina. Uh, which is definitely the place of the poems I'll be reading tonight. Um, I use nature in my poems often to capture the emotional state of the speaker as a but usually as a way to lift the speaker out of a certain certain situation. Nature or usually the animal guides the speaker into a new emotional state and it usually guides the people that community into a new emotional state. Um, yeah, I think that's enough. Um, all right. Uh, the matter of things. I'm telling you the plain truth. You would think a town with this many poor folks peeling potatoes was unhappy. But getting off the sun bus, my mama was waiting there with the other mama's thick piece of maple at her hip for any Carolina dog between here and where she's covered my room with a thousand plastic stars. We are citizens of their upstairs laughter and their Tupperware clear tears carried to two jobs, cleaning office buildings four nights a week. My house, like everyone's, had a table to sit down some troubles. When the emptiness chose us, we dumped out lonely in the river like bad sugar wine or held it in the wicker basket with the fish who, like us, learn to embrace in their deaths. You would think we all just wanted to kill over in the dirt of our slapboard houses, but we greased our legs and went into our yards and made them hot, pink, purple, and beautiful, a ceremony of canna. You then scrubbed our houses like God was coming to get a plate. You would think we didn't have time to plant flowers and flower biscuits for every thumb here has dough under its nail and this priest's dream. We still gather in their flames because that's all our grandmothers had. You would think we couldn't kill a thing, but the deer knew to run, so did the squirrels. You would think we made the reddest devil horns when you say the Lord's name out loud. Um, so these are, these are from a, a, a new book of poems that, um, I'm, I've been working on this very much Youngsville, North Carolina, as this black town, but also as this imagined space. Um, and I, really, I think that's enough. Um, mama's poem. Mamas of their mama's mama's God, mamas of cantaloupe and tomato seeds, timber cutting mamas, mamas who bound sticks with wool, called it a hand. Mama said to reach back with. Mama helped cousin Tay, scared of birds all her life, touch the wing of a robin as it flew along the car. Mama's ready to flutter away from here, but mama stay. Mothball laying mamas, killing every snake in and out of their yards. Mamas of the land that's been flattened out, the black valley gone. Mamas who dance under the floodlights of a Friday night like pine needles do 
when burned by a child with their mama's lighter. Mamas who sung what they could not name, then would pass that song on to you. Mamas talking to dead husbands and nieces all night long, turning over Ancestor Hill looking for them. Mamas who rivered us clean, mamas who would and wouldn't strike their children. Mamas who made themselves smooth as pond stones and circled their eyes. More. Uh, Friday night on the hill. The gentle women are not so gentle when you ask them to do your hair last minute, their fingers weighted with the week. It started with a pinch of wine, then the cake arrived. Someone hungry and out of luck squirreled that God no more in the rush of all the Fords in town. So close to death on the Friday night, we could get downright animal, lonely as the only thing wounded in the field, surrendering to a piece of plywood made dance floor. I watched spirits entering a one room boarding house. The youngest of us wanted mostly to be held for a minute by our mamas or an older favorite cousin while they kicked dust to raspberry barrette. We touched the coins of light on our bodies from Uncle Duck's disco ball, the chicken thawing on the river colored counter. Have you ever seen black folks shimmer on the floodlights in summer? We are beautiful. You would think we grew out the precious ground. There's a place on the hill we can go. It's hurt me in so many ways, but tonight it loves me. And I'm sure as the moon raises the dead, it will roll and love you like a hill should. Um, I don't really know how much time to skip around a bit. Um, I've been thinking about my relationship with nature, uh, especially just growing up in the South and this, um, though we were dependent on nature, I don't know how much like our economic status didn't allow us uh, to maybe be fully in love with it. We were constantly contending with it. Um, a recipe. Chicken has carried us along, away from death. I mean, a chicken can go a long ways into the summer, bones becoming a winter suit. My aunt would take a few of her barbed rocks and my, my uncle would bring his Rhode Island reds. A cousin unthawed three pounds of chicken feet the night before from granddaddy's deep blue freezer green peppers chopped in half like a genie inside. And when you know how to get to the heart of it, you can feed a whole town. When you like feet and necks in your rice, when your mama taught you how to clean a, how to clean a knuckle because he doesn't want your bones to show, you can do ungodly things to animals. All right, uh, maybe just two more. It could be a lonely road. Perry, even though you drank something terrible on the weekends and scared the children with your thunder-filled night voice, you had your guitar and your good night songs that you played from your porch until you began to cry and had to go inside to hide yourself, Perry. You are not alone. A ribbon stripped of your home that you bleached every Sunday in your white house coat and black bonnet, playing North Carolina mass choir like our town's only good nun. Your sorry ass husband followed his west pointing dick in the hog smoke wind. You were taken in by your older sister, Aunt Liz and her sugar cakes and the house you grew up with your daddy's ghost still walking around, fixing the stove when it goes out. You Aunt Ribbon are not alone. Once I felt so rotten tooth alone until I looked at the lifeline on my hands and followed the kin map to the top of this hill and read the names on the stones, like Miss Harriet, gathering every woman to, your, to a pledge wooden table to discuss the no's and thank yous you would give at the Sunday service, the low down and down and out men. And after those women left your volunteered house, 
all you had was the moonlight touching your forehead, making you know you were not alone. The branches of pines are not alone because they have the powdered face possums, gray squirrels, and the deer, the color of my mama's hands sheltering under them, and the stars full of denial, being so far away and untouchable, swear they are alone until a child at a Friday night cookout for the first time looks up when the floodlights go down. The devil got God and some angels. God got the devil and some angels. My uncle's fishing pole has its string. Its string has its hook. The hook has its red worms and sad crickets. The crickets at the bottom of the cola bottle he keeps. We know they are not alone. We hear their gathered songs. All right, y'all, one last poem um, for the people of Nassau Street. Mile of owls answering the night in houses with axes laid against the back porch like lovers. Mile of bone readers telling you why your great aunt won't leave your baby alone. Fire makers, cucumber cutters, rabbit killers. I cheat made miles so it floods easy. Mild has made me cry my eyes empty. A strange smelling mile when my uncle makes a burn pile. An unbreathable mile. A ghost took mile. A whole mile of people depended on the first of the month. So a miracle making mile. A mile dying a minute. Some of them went blind from onions and cabbage molding in the dark. Some married under the natural arc of ponds and gums made in secret places with no one watching, made their own laws and a secret life. Some made the sweetest creams and poured them over enormous cakes. Some murmured ancient things into the ground, hoping it turned into fruit. Some knew how to take whatever they had and turn it into two. A few were no good and thrown out into the dog filled street. The superstitions, the superstitious ones warned us in mysterious ways, but was the forties filled with sharpened bones. Some repeated everything they saw so someone could tell you, so you could tell yourself this didn't happen. And so some knew they could never die. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those are from your new manuscript collection. Your yeah, oh, yeah, new new book. New book. It's uh, they sound amazing, Tyree. Thank you for sharing them with us. And Thank I don't you. know if you noticed, but um, the birds were kind of chirping in as you read. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, our next reader is Dr. Diana Woodcock. Uh, Diana's latest poetry collection is facing aridity. And it was a finalist for the 2020 Prism Prize for Climate Literature. So uh, Diana currently teaches at the Virginia Commonwealth University's Arts Qatar. And I was just telling her just before our program started, I did not realize that it is 2 a.m. in the morning where she is. So I'm so grateful to you for being here. Uh, Diana, thank you again. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yeah, and it's okay that it's 2 a.m. I'm just happy to be part of this. Uh, so, um, yes, I'm joining from Qatar, uh, and it is, uh, well, it's now, what, 2.20 a.m. Um, uh, when I came here in 2004, which is almost <laughs> nearly two decades ago, I came for one year, and that one year has turned into all this time, uh, yeah, it's it's been a very interesting experience living in this desert environment, uh, which maybe is what led me to um, to do a research trip in the uh, near the Arctic Circle, which is where uh, some of the poems I'm going to read um, this evening are, are uh, taken from or inspired by. Um, so I will. Um, I think I'll just um, go ahead and, and share, start reading, start sharing the screen and, and start reading. Um, so let's see, I think it's this one, yes. Uh, okay, so yeah, the poems uh, I'll be reading are from my uh, recently released poetry collection, Facing Aridity. 
Uh, and the first poem opens the collection. Um, so why we must not fast forward past the scene. Desperate to find resting space, they've scaled heights they shouldn't have, and now their poor eyesight's causing them to misjudge the distance to the sea. Tumbling off 250 foot high sharp cliffs to their deaths, one ton marine mammals smash onto the rocky beach and fellow pinnipeds below lie limp in crashing waves of Alaska's Chukchi Sea in these climate changing days projected decades ago coming sooner than expected, sea ice habitats melting, fueling monster hurricanes, torrential rains, crop killing droughts and disease. It, is, it isn't hard to see loss of biodiversity and humanity's fate are intertwined. There's no time to waste. We must not cover our eyes, must realize and face the heartbreaking facts, swiftly act to keep fossil fuels in the ground, sound the alarm whoever, wherever we are. Protest against all grotesque climate change deniers. Too soon, Pacific walruses' doom will be our own. From, our, from my desert home with its oil and gas fields, its tainted air and sickness everywhere, I pray for the lands of white vistas, glaciers and seas. May they stay free of oil slicks protected from those with tricks up their sleeves. Pray we'll all rise up and believe in our right to demand and win climate justice for the walrus and for us. Bathing in moonlight tonight, the skin at its height of sensuality, I face the tragic reality, my kin, Pacific walrus are near their end. Driven by selfish men to the cliff edge, and we were right behind them, the whole world on the edge, all of us together in this fight for life, each summer, winter, day, minute, the last. Witnessing the tragedy we ensure we will endure and resist, will risk it all to remain steadfast. In 2016, I participated in, in the Arctic Circle Summer Solstice Art and Science Expedition to the High Arctic, for which I received a, a grant from my university. Um, it allowed me to explore through creative writing the world's northernmost tip as I researched the Arctic Circle's natural resources and history, sailed the waters between Norway and the North Pole, and observed the research being conducted in the region. The following poems resulted from that experience. Near the Arctic Circle. Day one, waiting to set sail, the mind fixed on creel, seals, blue whales, and the thought of omega-3 pills offered for sale at pharmacies and amazon.com. Krill oil supplement a detriment to seabirds and mammals to the critically endangered blue. Foundation of the ocean's food web, small shrimp-like crustaceans in decline by 80% on the front lines of climate change, melting sea ice finishing their habitat. Ocean acidification impairing these key players in slowing global warming. Carbon dioxide transported by them from surface to deep water. The mine weighed down by facts, then lifted this first day out west coast of Spitsbergen by a long, slender, thin whale. The captain killed the engine. We all kept still, silent, holding breaths and waiting five, 15 minutes for each reaching, each tall blow 20 feet high. Day two, I would see my first blue, but this first day out, it would be a fin that stole my heart away. Eyes no longer glazed over by calendar and date book. I would look upon one fin and realize how seasons run. I would become that first day devoted to fins, recalling they were the ones to outrun whaling ships, early commercial fishing days, till steam-powered vessels and explosive harpoons caught up with them. Watching one fin in that one of a hundred places where mystery's source can still be sensed, I'd be brought to my knees as Wilco promised, watching the ease of a fin whale causing the sea to rise and swell, its compulsion to move through water, my conscience taken along for the ride, joy to rise out of me each time. It's sickle-shaped dorsal fin with surface, sun-dazzled, and I decide this fin holds within its being all the answers, like a mandala precisely designed and swept away. Pilgrimage to the North Pole. One sea angel, tiny gastropod, feeding on ice algae has me meditating on the green brown sludge of life essential to the survival of blue whales and polar bears, penguins, seals, and tiny krill. 
now with polar sea ice vanishing, scientists sail toward the North Pole to extol it, smashing frozen seas to search massive chunks of ice for it, the timing of its bloom still a mystery, assumed that it starts in June. They have found other Wise. With warmer weather thinning ice, it's blooming early. The copods that gorge on a peak prematurely, and little off parents have no food for their chicks. Now one sees how the stakes are raised, the ripple effects from krill up to polar bear as sea ice melts. I think we should all make a pilgrimage, not to Mecca's Kaaba or Jerusalem's Wailing Wall, not to Mexico City's Our Lady of Guadalupe. No, I say. We should journey like China's ancient poets into their mountains, to the polar regions, descend into the unknown ice, be thrown off balance as we search for algae while chunks of sea ice are smashing and breaking, thrashing around us, search for strands of the sludge of life and come to understand we are kin. Only when we let ourselves fill with the thrill of a naturalist will the excitement of an untrammeled north and south pole draw us back into the circle of life, ice, Bright as pear blossoms, algae pale as an amber L giving itself to the krill and all others who hunger. Svarbard Global Seed Vault. Outside Longyearbyen, 800 miles from the North Pole, scientists counting and envisioning the cost of past and future disasters, even Syria's civil war, Aleppo's seed bank destroyed by bombing 2015, have tucked into a mountainside, ensured in permafrost, ample space for four and a half billion critical crop seeds worldwide. If the worst should happen, this backup collection will safeguard vegetation. Or is it all mere speculation? No place feasible but the hereafter. But how to disentangle ourselves from earthly Arctic time and space? Standing in front of the entrance to the doomsday seed vault, something about it putting a halt to doubt, I began envisioning what the seeds are all about. Was it too late to practice faith? The law from Kuwait had brought seeds from her desert home, assuming she could contribute them right there and then. Tottering on the threshold of before and after, I prayed for faith as small as that biblical mustard seed. Immersed myself, I coaxed in the hope of seeds that someday planted, they can reverse the damage, feeling a thirst for roots, recalling the burning bush, her thorns and thistles are not the Earth's original natural fruit. I wished upon a seed deposited just then in the scattered that snow bunting, warbling, and hunting insects beside the mountain stream, flowing past the global sea vault toward the sea under the midnight sun. Arctic berg. Zodiac rod to a glacier day five. The big event, a huge blue streaked iceberg capped from the glacier like a monumental sculpture broke in half right in front of us as if a guide taking us along for the ride had arranged it after which we sailed through the open water in between the two ice blue chunks, one half brown with swept up rocks and gravelly brown. These, the sounds all around, sizzling and explosive popping of the berg as tiny air bubbles broke free, stalactite like drip of drifting melting ice, melt ponds trickling widening cracks, leaking nutrients into the water. Calving of the glacier, all this noisy activity while a black guillemot sat serenely on a, on a nearby ice floe, its bright red feet planted as firmly as anything can be in these faltering times. I think maybe my time is up. Maybe I need to stop there, but <laughs> we'll stop with the faltering times. There's that. All right. Well, thank you, um, Diana. It's just amazing to think about the um, many, you know, amazing landscapes that you must have moved through in the past two years and writing about that Arctic view plus the desert view and everything else in between. So thank you for sharing some of your worlds. Uh, yeah. Now we move on to our third reader, Padma Pani L. Perez. Padma is a published poet and owner of the acclaimed Mount Cloud Bookshop located in my home city of Baguio in the Philippines. And I think they're on, you're online, right? So I believe they can take orders from anywhere in the world. So check them out. Check out Mount Cloud. Thank you also for waking up early. Uh, Padma's uh, an uh, anthropologist by training, but 
recently she has been very involved as lead strategist for creative collaboration of the Agam Agenda, which is an art science initiative of the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. And I'll let her tell you about that and the wonderful new anthology, which just came out of all of the collective efforts of uh, their team and all the uh, international writers and artists who contributed to that. Thank you, Louisa. It's really great to be here and to listen to Tyree and Diana and later to Claire as well. Um, I'm going to start by talking about my work, sharing a couple of poems, and then tell some stories. And I hope I can do that all um, within the time I'm given. So as Luisa mentioned, I'm a child of Baguio. It's a mountain city. At the moment, however, I live in Manila, the capital miasma of the Philippines. I work here, although nowadays it's possible to work anywhere. Work. Every night between two hedges, a spider strings the filaments of her web across the path leading from the garden to the street. Every morning, I walk into the web. In my haste, I forget to duck. I brush it off my cheeks and lips, muttering apologies to the spider. Every night, she builds a web again. And every day, I wreck it on my way to work. Growing up in Baguio shaped my relationship with nature. I was allowed to run wild much of the time. And as an only child for the first 12 years of my life, I spent more time talking to trees, flowers, earthworms, beetles, streams, and my dog than I did other humans. Um, when I wasn't outside, I was on the sofa reading. So I understood from early on that nature held me, but also that if I didn't pay attention or move with care, nature could hurt me badly, or I might hurt nature. And then adulthood relegated that relationship to the background. And what came were tough years. How many times have you said to yourself or thought out loud, it's been a tough year. It's not the years that are hard on us, my love. For the years themselves are weathered devotees. They are seasons come around again and again, only to see that nothing was learned and that we love them less and less. One would have to be tough indeed to be a year. Thank you. So for a time, I paid less attention to nature and shifted to speaking about the environment and environmental issues as an anthropologist. I spoke of nation state, natural resources, society here, nature out there. My sight turned inward toward the dark in me. And now comes a long process of learning to talk to plants and animals again with my daughters as my tutors. I'm tuning in with all my senses to nature's omnipresence. Even here in a city where my neighbor, the Philippine Pied Fantail, must raise their voice for their song to be heard above the roaring traffic. But it's just good to know I have them as neighbors, even here. So as Luisa said, I currently work um, at the Agam Agenda, and I'm gonna just share screen now to talk a little bit about that work. Here we go. Come on. Okay. And my job um, at the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities is as an organizer. So my job is to conceptualize and organize creative collaborations between writers and artists so that together we can do the work of widening the storytelling circles around climate change and shift narratives away from victimhood and the apocalyptic towards collective agency and hope. 
Um, these photos are from our first anthology, Agam Filipino Narratives on Uncertainty and Climate Change. And these are all portraits of Filipinos who survived extreme weather events across the archipelago, to which several writers were invited to respond um, as writing prompts. Recently, I, was, I had the pleasure of putting together with editor for Africa, Rehana Rousseau, editor for Latin America, Alexandra Walter, and co-editor Red Constantino, Harvest Moon, Poems and Stories from the Edge of the Climate Crisis. Um, like Agam, it contains photographs, poems, short stories, and essays in 11 languages from 24 countries. So, Bahasa Indonesia, Chinese, English, Filipino, Kankanae, Binisaya, Turkish, Spanish, Zapotec, French, um, Swahili. And it was really incredible to get all these submissions um, pouring in from around the world. Luisa is also a contributor to this book, and we're very lucky to have her as a frequent and enthusiastic collaborator of Agam Agenda. The making of Harvest Moon followed the creative process of our first book, so we selected black and white photographs showing um, humans or traces of the human and the environment. These were sent out to writers in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and Latin America with a list of prohibited words. It was 32 um, words or phrases long, and the first word on the list was climate change, followed by global warming, followed by um, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on. The intention was to steer away from the jargon around climate change because when terminology and technical know-how is privileged, we tend to lose sight of the personal grief taking place in our own homes, and we lose sight of hope as well. And we all know the impact of climate change goes beyond numbers defining degrees of temperature increase. But we forget. Um, so consider this. This is a, from a short story in Harvest Moon. Maybe forsaking my village and living in the city makes me a coward, like everybody else. But I have to be a man and do what is necessary to get on with life. And am I not better off now? Here I am. I am back and I'm ready to take my parents with me to a life of comfort in the city. But when Ibu hears my invitation, she retreats into the house. Bapa turns away from me as I plead with him to leave Limboto Lake. This is from the short story Legacy, written in Bahasa Indonesia by Dharmawati Majid and translated into English by Nabi Hashahab. And it's about the painful circumstances that lead so many people, young people especially, to leave their homes in places around the world where that are hammered by droughts, floods, super typhoons, or the violence of extractive industries. Um, and to me, reading this story is so different from studying policy papers on climate-related migration. You know, we don't call ourselves climate refugees, at least not yet. So science and policy are essential, but sorry, they are also not enough. So much about the climate crisis has been measured and is being measured as we speak. We need poets, artists, and storytellers to make the immeasurable matter. Immeasurable such as love, solidarity, compassion, and the terrible beauty of our world. So this year we're doing just that through our global campaign of poetry and art called When Is Now. And we are inviting writers and artists, all of you, everyone that's listening and everyone that's sitting with me here, to share stories and visions. And beyond this, we are asking people to lend, to tend to the creative seeds planted by others from other parts of the world. So in this way, you know, we reach across our borders and we can say to one another, I'm here and I hear you, and I will carry your story. If we're going to create kinder futures, we need to start practicing kindness 
now and here's one way we can do this so we invited poets to submit creative seeds let me just check do i still have um time okay um we invited poets to submit creative seeds sorry about my mouse jumping around um and this one is by Wangui Wakamonji from Kenya, and she writes, Our Bodies Remember. Come closer. Talk to me about my body. It aches nowadays with such strange pains. I wonder, do these bodies know their ways any longer? And when will they remember? Will the old scattered seeds sprout again? What time does the class on memory start? Can you tell me? I don't want to be late. Meanwhile, come. Let's gather close. This cold pushes knives through my still young bones, and my chest gets thick and heavy, though I carry on breathing. Robert McFarlane selected two lines from Mongui's poem and place them in his poem, Pack the Hall to the Rafters. What time does the class on memory start? Can you tell me? I don't want to be late because I want to remember when yellow ducks could not swim through the glacier, when the river was alive and silver as an eel, when the beech trees had not begun their long walk north, when soil did not speak in the stars of drought. So can you show me how to tell the time? How? Now, the class starts now, but the clouds are the teachers and the seeds, the rain, the air. So make room at the back there, back the hall to the rafters, creatures. And Neha Sinha in India, responded with frogs need friendship again she took two lines from rob's poem and put them in her own when i asked the tree why she wept she said her buttress was swept in a concrete girdle when i asked the frog why he left he said he was lonely on dry cement when i asked the minister why he loved cement he said it was meant for him me and my country and dreams of racing Double GDP. When will we break cement borders, tidy things that commit murders? When will we face down to foster frog friendships? When will we rise to hold trees, not tenders as mother ships? We will, tonight, call my mothers, call my sisters, call my daughters. So make more room at the back there Pack the halls to the rafters, creatures. Take root, plant a seed. Tonight we decarbonize. Take root, plant a seed. Tonight we decolonize. And the invitation is open for anyone to respond on our website. I'll be dropping the links after this. Of course, this is Robert. And Neha wrote a wonderful book, Wild and Willful, about seven um, Indian species, endangered species. Amazing book. Another way in which we're inviting artists to respond is by taking lines of poetry and painting them on murals. So Wangui's poem was selected by two young women from Bangalore who painted the mural you see above with her lines of poetry. And a poem by Malebo Sepodi from South Africa was selected by an artist in Jogjakarta who incorporated her two lines from her poem into the mural that you see below. And this year we'll be doing um, more of this um, on When Is Now, inviting people to respond and also organizing events offline and um, public interventions and public art events for artists and poets to collaborate and to tend to each other's poetry. So visit our website, whenisnow.org. And let us know if you'd like to be part of this. We would love so much for the seeds to spread. Um, everywhere and I will leave you with this which is our prompt for um, 
this year's campaign. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Padma. That was such a uh, generous and powerful um, like summation. I don't know if that's the right word, but an invitation for all of us to participate in this wonderful like uh, global renga in, in poetry and art. So last but not least, now I am thrilled to have Claire Womanholm read for us. And Claire, as you all know, is an acclaimed poet. She has wonderful uh, books and a new one coming out in 2023. The author of Wilder or Wilder, Red Mouth and the forthcoming Meltwater. And she makes her home currently in the Twin Cities. Uh, and I just wanted to say that um, I've been reading a couple of uh, like anthologies and I came across this line written by a scholar in a book called Remainders. I think this is from Stanford University Press. And this is Margaret Ronda and I quote, she writes, how can a poem speak for, to, or with ecological phenomena? Can poetry give matter and creaturely life a voice, a face? How does a poem make loss and extinction visible? or register new and disturbing presences? How ought responsibility for ecological calamity be adjudicated at the level of the individual and the collective? And I feel that the language in Claire's poems gives us such clear images of the world, even while in the throes of environmental and other crises, or even when uh, we confront the so-called limits of individual perception and ethical response. So I give you Claire Womanholm. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Louisa. That was really, really gratifying. Um, hello, happy Earth Day. I'm really happy to be in this digital space with y'all. Um, I, again, am in the Twin Cities where we are very much waiting for spring. It is very gray and cold. There are no leaves on the trees. Um, being an urban Midwest writer is a great exercise in imagination and memory, like I spend a lot of time remembering. And if that fails, imagining like what lushness and warmth feel like and look like, um, it's really great. Uh, but the Minnesota actually, and specifically the city where a lot of my family lives, Duluth, um, has been described as like one of these like climate change destinations. Like it's a region of the country that's actually supposed to quote unquote benefit, like it's gonna get more temperate and like more livable. And so like people are coming from around the country actually to move to Minnesota and Duluth in particular, which is really wild. I'm like, why, why would you do this? But apparently this is this is the thing that's happening. Um, I'm going to start with a poem from Wilder, which is here, which came out in 2018, um, and then do two from my third book, Meltwater, um, which Louisa mentioned is coming out next March, and then also finish with a brand new one. Um, so this one from Wilder is called The Last Animals. We saw them from the top of the hill. The wind blew past our ears and down into the valley where they straggled up to their tails in snow. One spotted, one striped, one the color of dead leaves. Our encyclopedia had told us about animals, but none of us had ever seen a real one. To see the last of something wasn't new. We had seen many last things, the last acorn, the last lightning storm, the last tide. All the last things had the same smell, a solvent we could taste on the air, which is how we always knew to pay attention. The animals were moving steadily across the valley. We passed around the encyclopedia and studied the pictures, but none of them matched. Someone broke a stick from the last tree and tried to scratch the animal's outlines into the frozen dirt of the last vegetable patch, but it wouldn't take. The animals were crossing the valley faster than we could follow. Our nails broke as we raked at the soil. When we next looked up, our eyes filled with snow. Um, and so that poem is part of an explicitly kind of post-apocalyptic sequence that I had written. Actually, like that poem, I 
looked at the date that I started it and I wrote it in like January 2017, like right at the beginning of the Trump years. Um, and I was just pinned down by dread. Like my first daughter had been born the month before and I was like, oh my God, what world did we invite her into, right? Not the one I had been picturing. Let me tell you, it felt a little bit like a bait and switch. Um, but I wrote a lot of these poems that I would, I would call apocalyptic during those years. Um, if you like that sort of thing, you can buy Wilder and check them all out. Um, and it was, I was so panicked um, that I just kind of shut myself off from the real world. And I lived instead in this one that my dread had built. Um, but as time has gone on, I found myself less interested in inhabiting that particular space. And, you know, maybe it's because that administration and its supporters were and like still are so gleefully and selfishly uncoupled from reality that it just kind of made me see the selfishness in that own mode of writing, like conjuring up a version of nature in service of my own emotional state. Um, and it's felt more and more important to me to make kind of clear statements about what, like about this world and about what we are standing to lose in terms of ecosystems and species diversity and climate stability, among other things. Um, and so I think lately, like the poems in Meltwater, um, the next couple I'm gonna read, have become more kind of eco-poetic in that way. Um, like this next one, which is called O, like the letter, um, and it's the opening poem from Meltwater. O. Once there was an opening, an operation, out of which oared the ocean, then oyster and oyster catcher, opal and opal crowned tanager. From ornateness came the ornate flycatcher, an ornate fruit dove, from oil, the oil bird. O is for Opus, the Orphean warbler's octaves, the oratorio of Orioles. O for the Osprey's ostentation, the owl and its collection of ossicles. In October's ochre, the orchard is overgrown with olive and orange, oleander and oxlip, ovals of dew on the oat grass. O for obsidian, onyx, or for boreholes like inverted obelisks. O for the onion's concentric O's, observable only when cut, for the opium oozing from the poppy's globe only when scored. O for our organs, for the os of the cervix, the double O's of the ovaries plotted on the body's plane to mark the origin. O is the orbit that cradles the eye. The oculus opens an O to the sky where the starry outlines of men float like bubbles between us and oblivion. Once there were oarfish, opalized olive flounders. Once the oxbows were not overrun with nitrogen. Oh, for the mussels opening in the ocean's oven. Oh, for the rising ozone, the dropping oxygen, for algae overblooming like an omen or an oracle. Oh, earth outgunned and outmanned. Oh, who holds the void inside itself. Oh, who has made orphans of our hands. Um, so, oh, is one of a sequence of alphabet poems I've been working on over the last several years. Um, each poem is titled with a letter of that alphabet, O, L, S, P, et cetera. Um, and as you're here, they're sort of, they're driven by alliteration. Um, and writing these poems is a process that involves a lot of outside input. Like it's not possible for me to just sit down and write one in isolation out of my own imagination. Um, I don't generally have an idea of what that poem is gonna do or be about before I start it. I start by like, going to the OED and making a word list um, of like of as many viable words as could start with a given letter. And if you have a letter like E, it's like 20 pages long. Anyway, it's a lot of, ends up being a lot of words. Um, and then I'll sort of take a step back and just kind of see what arises from that list. Like, oh, how words talk to each other, what little webs they make. Um, are there certain words that clump together semantically, but also are there some that are just related by sound or even how the words like look physically on the page. Um, and this often means that the worlds of like astronomy and architecture can kind of live together this way. The worlds of like ornithology and mythology can exist in the same ecosystem of the poem. And the thing is like, you can make connections out of anything. There are so many ways to be alike, um, which I find very sweet and very organic. Um, the last, the rest of the poems that I'm gonna read too, um, are also alphabet poems. The next one I'll read is called P, and it includes several children's book titles, um, which you may recognize. Um, and the one you might not is a book called Plip Plop Pond. And it's one of those books that's billed as like indestructible, like babies can't tear the pages, you can run it over with your stroller, you can put it in the bathtub, whatever. Um, 
but there's a downside to those, um, as you will see. P. P is for picture book, the pillow at our backs, my daughter in her poo and piglet pajamas, the pressure on my windpipe that is supposed to be unwrapping itself. P is for peace or peace lily or peace rose or even peach. P is not for Permian Basin and its pipelines and petrochemical plants, not for pangolin, not for pandemic, not tonight. Picture the pika's patter patter or Peter Rabbit misplacing his shoe among the potatoes going lippity lippity through the parsley. P is for peekaboo for this little piggy. I open plip plop ponds, flash spun polyethylene pages and point to the polywogs and lily pads. I pretend the phosphorus is not proliferating, the pH is not plunging. I flip to Paddington, perched politely outside the lost property office, and try not to picture the cruise ships pumping sewage into Peruvian ports. I try to picture Polynesia, Papua New Guinea, Papite, without the Pacific princess plying the waters. P is for pufferfish and porcupine fish, I say. P is for plague ship. P is for Point Nemo, where deprogrammed spacecraft plummet like Phaeton, pinwheel into smaller and smaller rain, pepper the waves with photocells and paint chips. Around it, the garbage patch pearls its plastics, the pieces smaller than plum pits, smaller than pixels, pinpricks, plankton. Once P is for plastic, it is always for plastic. I open each peach pear plum to spy it hidden in the ptarmigan, the pheasant, and the thallow blue of the Portuguese man of war. I read the princess and the pea and swear I can feel the pellets in each layer of the ocean, epipelagic, mesopelagic, past where light penetrates into the bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, where scientists have found polyester in the molten putty between the Pacific and Philippine plates. I sing baby beluga and see pods of pilot whales with pool floaties pretzeled inside their pelvic cavities. I see the polybezoars packed inside the camel's guts. P is for the pelt of plastic growing over the Pearl River, pontoons of polar spring, propel, and Panama blue bottles, bottles that once held the pills we take to make ourselves feel less like prey, the Purell bottles more permanent than permafrost. I turn the page, but it's a palindrome of panic. The petrol preens petroleum from its plumage, the propeller pulps the back of the porpoise. My daughter has slipped into sleep. I place her outside my arm's parenthesis so she can't feel my pulse pounding. P is for parachute, I whisper across the placenta of her dreaming. P is for pearl, penicillin, picnic, planetarium, platypus, plink, the pocket-sized pipistrelle, the ponderosa, and its pine beetles. I turn up the pink noise on her sound machine so she can't hear that P is also the end of chirp, tulip, kelp, scallop, ice cap, sleep. Um, I started this alphabet sequence after my first child was born and we were reading a lot of like children's abecedarians, right? Like A is for apple, B is for bear. Um, like that's how we introduce children to the world. And it got me thinking about a particular generation of children, like of which my children are included. And like, what might a realistic or at least like maybe a non-cliched abecedarian look like? Like C is for catastrophe, D is for drought. You know, like that sounds horrible. I don't want to read that, but um, you know, and you want to, protect your children from that. You want to protect them from pain, but at the same time, you don't want to insulate them from beauty and love. And you would have to, to eliminate pain, right? It's painful to love things. Love is deeply attuning and terrifying and risky. It requires connection and responsibility. Um, and it hurts to love the earth fully because we are increasingly signing up for mourning and grief. It's not unlike having children in that way. Um, and it makes sense to want to shield yourself from that. Like it's so much easier emotionally to regard the earth as a resource, as a tool, as something to extract from and hold yourself separate from, but that's delusional and deeply limiting on an existential level. Um, so loving the earth for me means inviting pain into my life and into my poetic practice. Joy too, obviously, but those things are not necessarily meaningfully different for me. Um, but here's the, um, the last one I'm going to read. It's called S. Um, Thank you for letting me like talk some things out um, and for your own care and attention. S. The story starts this way. A sea ago, there swam the smallest something. Then a spore. Then a seed sailed into the sand and surfaced as sprout, seedling, sapling. Soon a spruce, a softwood stand. 
a forest whose synonym is shelter, whose synonym is shield, as in shell, as in held, as in tells the self to hush, as in that which salves the sore, sore from which sorry comes. And we are standing among the saw timber. We are sorry, splitting it into shingles, subdividing the stubble, sending our satellites into space from which we survey the rubble. We are sore ashamed, slouching through scrub oak, shrubland, silvage that shelters the skunk, salamander, swift, swallow, snail, snake, stork, stag, sumac, squirrel, sparrow, spider, sunflower, saxifrage, sable, sugar maple. We are sour in our sadness. The sepal supports the soapwort's petals. The sycamore supports the sulfur shelf. We staked, stake, will stake our claims. The story is a soil in which we sow our syllables, which spread and spread, which speak of us as the only subject. We are slick as oil and sick from our spoils. We stand on the wooded shoulders we sliced a road between. We stick like sap to everything. We are sorry in all season, the snowy and the summer, sorry for the silvicides and the silt and the surface water, for the spotted owl and the short-nosed seahorse. For the whippoorwill's swoop and sally, its feathers secret and stippled, whose song sounds like sequins, sounds like a stream, whose song shimmers. Sing, sang, sung, is that how the story will run? The whippoorwill does not shelter its eggs. They survive through stealth, through something sense to stay small as a salmon scale, small as a segment of a soft-bodied worm, the softest sphagnum step. We shelter in the study of the shepherd and steward. With science, we scissor and scoop and sample, but it is, a, it is a sweetless syrup, stoic and slow. We sift through scenarios. There is softness enough and shelter enough. There is sufficient space and sedge and salt, but we are sore, scared. Statistics shred the sinews that hold a hopeful body together. The nest is shrapneled. The holes in the sieve swell. Things spill, spilled, will spill. The stepping stones are farther and farther apart, the shore farther and farther away. Sorry, I'm sorry, they're sorry, she and he are sorry, and we, someone, should surely save us, should someday, surely, the story shouldn't end this way. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, yeah, I'm seeing all the comments and everyone's clapping and putting hearts in the chat. I think we can take a few questions if all of you are game. Uh, there's one for starters from Leslie. By the way, come back on Friday, 6 p.m. next week. I will have Leslie here as our featured guest talking about uh, poetry's possible worlds. So Leslie says, I loved what Claire just said about the role of research in her process. I would like to hear about how research works for the other poets too, because it enriches poetry vastly, but can also overwhelm. So uh, any thoughts on that from the rest of our guests? And your hair is fabulous, sis. Another Leslie. So um, any thoughts on research and your writing, Padma or Tyree or Diana? I can say a little about that. I can say a lot, but I won't. <laughs> um, so as an anthropologist, I, I did a lot of that kind of research. And, and I have to say that my relationship is kind of different to research as a writer because for sure I was overwhelmed by it. and. Um, I still can't, um, to the point that I felt colonized by the language of academic research and, and academic writing, and I'm still trying to break away um, from that. So um, currently, that's my, that's my relationship um, with research. I'm glad to be done with it, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I love Claire's um, research as well for her work and i'm and right now i'm still looking for how can i do research on my own terms about the things i love and the things that matter to me now um of course there's still going to be heartbreak heartbreak being part of the reason i i moved away um from research and what that was showing me of the world but um maybe there's another way to do it. And I think 
Claire's work shows us some of that. So thank you. Anything for our other guests, or is there any other question uh, in case you know we can chat about some other aspect of that or an offshoot of that? There is a question in the Q and A section. Oh, where? Are you? Okay. Why am I not seeing that? Do you see that? Oh, yes. Now I see it. All right. So Cindy says, "Where do you find yourself now, on that line between hope and despair?" And how does it impact your writing? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Cindy. It's a big question. It's hard to answer. Um, uh, maybe I'll and I'll try to speak on the other question as well. Um, in terms of research, it's for me. It's a balance. Um, for me, like things that I know from memory will start showing up in the work. And I'm like, I'm sure there's an actual term from this. And then that will lead to the research and then they kind of swinging back and forth. Um, uh, as, far, uh, as far as between hope and despair, I, I'm writing a very much an imagined space. Um, so I'm, um, I, I'm, I remember things that happened particularly in Youngsville but now it's not now I'm trying to rewrite those memories, but I'm just trying to see other possibilities. And, and that's that's where the joy maybe comes in. Yeah, I can relate to that. Uh, yeah, so Suzanne says that was probably a good response to the question which was typing. But yeah, I relate to that a lot too. I write a lot about history myself and I kind of research a little bit, but uh, it's, um, very curious how our our relationship to history is also something that we need to kind of keep recalibrating because everything that we see in history we feel might already have been written but actually through poetry I feel like we can approach it in a different way that is perhaps like that space that Tyree is talking about I feel like poetry offers a space to explore the things that might not have happened or might not have been told the way we wanted them to be told. So I feel like poetry is another method of intervention and that history is not necessarily over and done. With poetry, we, we can do that. We can do that in poetry. Okay, well, I am very happy that we had you here. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, your attention and your time. Uh, and we will see you here next Friday for Leslie Wheeler and a program on exploring poetry's possible worlds. If you need the link, just go to the Facebook uh, page of the Muse Writers Center and hit events or go to the Muse Writers Center website, also hit events and you'll get to that. So thank you again and good night friends or good morning. Have a nice sleep in, <laughs> Diana, long into Saturday morning. You've earned it. <laughs>